Hi everyone and welcome to the What Green Recovery webinar by Earth Journalism Network. Uh, it's going to be a webinar for journalists on climate action in the wake of COVID-19. Um, first of all, thank you to EJN for organising this webinar. Um, I'm really excited to be here and looking forward to learning a lot from our three speakers, Tian Lin, Jeffrey Bayer and Enrique. Um, please send them your questions as we go along. Um, my name's Laura, I'm going to be moderating. I'm a freelance journalist based in Brussels where I do a fair bit of green policy reporting and some longer features on resources. Um, I can tell you a bit about the journalism aspect of that in a couple of minutes. Um, but the important, the first thing to talk about is the, uh, the uh, Earth Journalism Network is, is launching a new story grant. Um, we're going to also be including details about that in the chat um, within the webinar as we go along. Do check that out if you're looking to cover green recovery stories um, and maybe listen out to potential angles that we're going to hear from um, our panellists. Um, so green recovery, what is green recovery? Um, in effect, it's this two pronged approach to um, recovering economies from the impact of the coronavirus pandemic, while also kickstarting the green economic transition that we need in the face of climate and biodiversity crises. Um, lots of countries are launching recovery packages and these are amounting to trillions globally. Um, Jeffrey is going to tell you a lot more about this, um, but of course there's a journalistic imperative to keeping tabs on these funds. Um, in Europe, uh, yeah, we've, we've got the recovery and resistance facility. Um, here, 37% of that is supposed to be spent on projects that are green. So journalists covering this topic can look into sort of, I've separated it into three, three areas. Um, first, I mean, they can talk about this 37% amount and, and get involved in the debate, the debate about whether or not it should be more. And there are some really good uh, online tools for looking at that from Carbon Brief, places like Carbon Brief and uh, the, green, the EU Green Recovery Tracker. Um, and then within that 37%, it's really important to be scrutinizing whether these green promises are, are really actually green. Um, in, in Europe, there's a really important conversation going on about uh, a parallel green taxonomy. This taxonomy is gonna be a criteria of, of what counts of, as a green project. And if, if a project can get onto this list or if a technology can get onto this list, it then becomes eligible for all kinds of um, funding streams. Um, so there's, there's debates going on yeah, pretty much every day, whether uh, important technologies can get onto this list, things like nuclear and whether gas can be considered a transition or kind of come under a separate amber, amber taxonomy. All of this stuff is happening right now. Uh, the, last, the last area um, that journalists should probably be looking at is then seeing once you've got that 37%, whether these uh, green promises are actually being fulfilled and monitoring monitoring them as we go along um for all these stories whether it's 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 news features or longer form um if you've got a few more words to spare um it, it's vital across all forms that it's the thrust of the piece is, is rooted in the new reports and studies that are coming out um and our panelists are going to be sharing some of their uh reports and their findings it, it's it's um statistics like this that end up in in journalism um so yeah, the, that it has a strong scientific basis is really important. Um, the last thing I would say that might be important for journalists to think about when covering green recovery is that uh, it's not always, because we're talking about policy a lot of the time, it's not always easy to bring that back and try to talk about how these policies are going to be impacting the wider public. Um, but it, I think it is important to remember that, okay, it, in a news piece that's 300 words long, you're probably not gonna be able to interview you interview people about their uh electric cars or whatever but um if you've got longer a long form 2000 word piece it's definitely a good idea to go knocking on doors even if you don't use that material it, it gives your um your story a kind of grounding i think which can be um it lifts the story but also it can be reassuring to you in this time when we're behind uh screens a lot of the time and it's kind of difficult to remember that there's actually uh real real world impacts of these policies um, so I could go on, but I'm going to say, yeah, get back to our panelists and say it's, it's a fairly new topic, green recovery. 
uh, doesn't excuse that most of the media is, is Western focused. So I'm really excited to welcome our speakers who've been covering policies from uh, other places around the world, all over the world. Um, First up, we have Jeffrey Beyer. He's a sustainability expert with 17 years experience um, across sustainability strategy, climate po policy, clean tech innovation, and green finance. Um, you'll see, if you Google him, you'll see lots of um, interesting articles about um, a, a report he co-wrote co uh, called The Greenness of Stimulus, Greenness of Stimulus Index, uh, comes through Vivid Economics. Um, and it's looking at the G20 countries and their stimulus, how green they are. Currently, he's founder and managing director of Zest Associates. It's based in Dubai and it's a sustain sustainability consultancy. Um, and he's also worked through extensively through global embassy and trade networks to develop effective climate and energy policy. Um, then we have Tian Lin. Tian is a, an environmental social scientist and she's a consultant at the World Agroforestry Center. Her recent work as a research consultant um, at Asian Parliamentarians for Human Rights um, created a report, a policy assessment on sustainable and just recovery from COVID-19. Um, working in international development, she's consulted results-based management research on landscape restoration, enterprise development, and forest governments across Southeast Asia. And then finally, we have Enrique A. Marchua Constantinidis. Constantinidis, excuse me. Uh, Enrique is a senior climate policy advisor for Fundación Ambiente y Recursos Naturales, or FAN, um, in Argentina. And he's responsible for their national and international advocacy activities on climate change. So he's probably exhausted from COP26. I believe he was up in Glasgow. Um, he served as an advocate of climate action for many years as a spokesperson for FAN and other organizations across Latin America, including at international climate conferences, yeah, um, and the negotiating tables. So um, without further ado, I'd just like to remind everyone to please submit your questions uh, as we go. But yeah, if uh, Tian, you'd like to take it away with your presentation. That oh, sorry, no, we're starting with Jeffrey, excuse me. Jeffrey, if you'd like to take us away with your presentation, that would be fantastic. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. And thanks, Laura, for the introduction. I think you teed up very nicely um, exactly what I'll be speaking about. So I'm looking at kind of global recovery uh, through the Greenness of Stimulus Index. And then I'm going to zoom into the European recovery uh, packages as well, the um, national resilience and recovery plans. So I'll just get started. The Greenness of Stimulus Index um, uh, assessed countries stimulus, uh, 20 countries stimulus around the world, uh, the OECD countries, plus another 10 countries, so 30 countries in total, to look at the environmental impact of stimulus spending. This, uh, this work I did in partnership with Vivid Economics and Finance for Biodiversity. Um, we released a series of reports that track the impact of stimulus measures across the pandemic, uh, and I'm going to share with you some of the outputs of, of that today. Um, so really the, the GSI, the Greenness of Stimulus Index, what was its purpose? It, it was really there to, to gauge the impact um, on the environment of, of stimulus measures, to track countries' progress over time, and to really identify those measures that were having a particularly positive or particularly negative impact on the environment. Um, the purpose was really to help decision makers align their stimulus decisions with, with um, nature positive and climate positive investments. Uh, to raise the profile of climate and the COVID-19 response and, and really enable a cross comparable um, index that, that you could compare countries' um, uh, response to, to COVID and its environmental impact. So this actually garnered quite a bit of attention, um, partly I think because of, of a graphic I'll show you on the next slide. Um, but, but firstly, just so you get a sense of the dimensions that we're talking about, there was about $17.2 trillion of COVID stimulus spending in the 30 countries that we tracked. Um, of that, uh, 12.4 trillion was um, not really relevant to the environment, but a full 4.8 trillion was, and, and that meant there was 4.8 trillion dollars worth of, of opportunity to have a positive impact or, or a negative impact. Um, and when we say environmentally relevant, we were looking at these five different sectors, energy, agriculture, industry, transport, and waste. Um, so assessing each of the measures that affected those sectors gave us ultimately a score for each country. And you can see there's kind of a positive and a negative contribution on this graph. The negative contribution is the red bar and the positive is the green. The yellow dots indicate the country's uh, final score on the, on the GSI index. And you can see there's a huge variance across different countries, right? 
On the right-hand side, those, those yellow dots are above the, above the x-axis there, and that shows that those countries had a net positive impact on, on the environment. For those countries on the left-hand side of the graph, their impact was net negative. Um, and it shows that there is a, uh, a negative stimulus. Some of these countries had a, a strong negative stimulus on the left-hand side. So Russia, Turkey, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, they poured a lot of money into business as usual, kind of fossil fuel intensive industries. Um, a lot of those countries on the right-hand side, the European Commission, Denmark, uh, Canada, and UK, um, put a lot of money into low carbon, low carbon investments. Canada is an interesting one. I'm not sure if you can see the third bar from the right, but they've got a lot of positive and a lot of negative stimulus. And, and really Canada tried to bail out its oil and gas sector while also investing in green technology and, and, and low carbon um, infrastructure. So uh, while they, they got a positive score, um, there was actually quite a bit of negative stimulus buried there. When you look um, at that environmentally relevant component, this 4.8 trillion, uh, and you break it down between climate and nature, you find that the vast majority of it was actually focused on climate resilience and, 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 and climate investments. And, and the nature component was quite a bit smaller. And this is, I think, an emerging theme coming out of, of um, not only these COVID discussions, but also uh, an approach to climate change in general. Um, we're recognizing that investing in in climate is, is um, a lot more mature, it's a lot more understood, uh, but investing in nature and biodiversity is I think one of these up and coming areas where um, new metrics and measures need to be developed to understand how um, investment really affects um, um, nature and biodiversity. And of course, there's an interplay between climate, nature and biodiversity, right? Uh, a healthy climate allows natural spaces to thrive and doesn't um, threaten um, natural spaces. At the same time, healthy, ecosystems um, are carbon sinks. They absorb carbon dioxide and, and uh, help, to, help to mitigate against climate change and provide adaptation responses to climate change as well. So there's definitely a link between climate and nature. And I think increasingly, we're going to be seeing more of the nature-focused uh, component of, of the response. This is... Um, uh, just, uh, I think, appropriate for the audience. So, I mean, the Greenness of Stimulus Index got a lot of pickup around the world. So we really, um, you know, we're able to speak with a lot of tier one and tier two outlets internationally and, and discuss the, the um, findings from the, from the GSI. And I think that really helped to inform the conversation internationally around um, the impact that COVID stimulus was having on the environment. Um, I, I spoke with a number of journalists, you know, from The Guardian, from Forbes and so on, and it was interesting because the, the questions actually were, they weren't easy questions. You know, I think journalists have a good uh, way of really trying to dig, dig into some of the detail um, and get really quotable, quotable outputs. So I learned after a couple of interviews, what is the real message? How do I frame that message in a way that's accessible and um, can be picked up in a headline or a short quote? So, so um, if you're struggling to get some, some good quotes from from people you interview ever and maybe just ask them you know what's in a nutshell can you tell me the the top two things that you'd do if you were in this position and that that for me helped help get out some of the the key points from the gsi i'm going to move on now to a, a separate um, study that was also done with uh, vivid economics um, looking at the national resilience and recovery plans of the european union um, uh, our assessment really wanted to dig into this nature component, as I mentioned, because that's quite important in an emerging uh, theme. And digging into the nature component showed us some very interesting, but not always very heartening results. Um, so to give you a sense of the overall picture, um, in terms of the scope of the study, we looked at 10 different European countries, um, 500 billion euros of investment, about half of which went to environmental sectors. Um, the method we used was the same greenness of stimulus index method I showed you above, looking at those five key sectors. Um, and the impact that we found was that the national resilience and recovery plans, these NRRPs, um, were actually quite, quite good for nature, or quite good for climate, I'm sorry, uh, but not so good for, for nature. And it really shows a need to invest in, in um, nature and nature-based solutions. Um, the implications from the NRRPs uh, investment choices really were that they didn't really enhance nature and biodiversity. Um, they missed a real opportunity in terms of jobs and economic growth and also emission reductions by failing to invest in nature. Um, and that we really need to develop a better method and approach to assess the impact of public finance on nature. 
I'm just going to show you a couple quick graphs here, um, uh, which I think are, are instructive. Uh, this first one shows that direct spending um, on, on the environment, while, while Laura mentioned that about 37% of spending needed to be green, we found actually about 51% of spending was relevant to the environment, um, but not all of it was green. So sometimes you had some investment in in measures that actually harmed the environment across those five sectors. Um, and you can see that when you break down the, the investment in climate relevant components or investment in nature relevant components, again, this bias towards climate investments uh, was very strong. You can see only 2% of investments uh, from the NRRPs went exclusively to nature, whereas 68% went exclusively to climate. And there was that kind of overlap of maybe 30% um, affecting both climate and nature. So again, a kind of underinvestment in nature as a whole. Um, and when we look at a couple of the key metrics, this is interesting, I think, for, for um, policymakers who really want to understand the, um, some kind of quantification of what's the impact of investing in nature. In this, in this study, we really tried to quantify that impact across a few different metrics. Um, gross value added is one of them, so GBA, which is this slide. We also looked at jobs and emission reductions. So, in terms of gross value added, which means you know, for every euro you invest in the economy, what's the return on that investment? Um, that's the gross value added. We found that nature-based solutions, um, actually you can see year one that circled green in for nature-based solutions. In just one year, if you invested a euro in nature-based solutions, you got one euro and two cents back in year one. Um, and over the full kind of 15 year horizon of nature based solutions for every euro you invested, you got one euro and 76 cents back. So they're very, very strong uh, returns on investment for nature based solutions. And they actually outperform uh, a reference basket of other types of investments. And you can see the graph on the left um, demonstrating which ones are especially strong. This, is, I think, is a really relevant piece because I think policymakers fail to understand the economic benefits of nature-based solutions and this really shows that they perform strongly. When you're looking at COVID response, they perform especially well, right? They generate so much more in return in year one when, when economies are struggling and need this kind of stimulus to take hold. Uh, and that's because when you're planting trees or creating um, uh, agroforestry, parks and gardens, wetland restoration, a lot of that work and effort happens in year one when, when um, those activities are, are taking place. So they're very good uh, stimulus measures, nature-based solutions. This next slide shows you the overall job uh, growth and job potential from investing a million euros in a nature-based solution. Again, nature-based solutions outperform an alternative basket in year one when, when um, jobs are most needed, when you're trying to recover from, from a, a pandemic or, or economic shock. And in the long term, uh, they're also quite competitive, producing 36 jobs for every million, million euros invested compared to 41 from an alternative basket. So again, really, really strong uh, performance. And this last graph, and this is my last slide, uh, looks at the um, emissions impact from nature-based solutions versus this variety of other potential investments. And you can see that nature-based solutions actually absorb carbon dioxide. They take carbon dioxide in, uh, whereas every other intervention produces emissions. Um, even even you know, green investments like, like retrofitting buildings or electric cars, um, electric buses, the fact is that while these kind of reduce you know, emissions compared to the alternatives that we're, we're using today, like uninsulated homes or, or diesel powered buses, still building a car or, or, or you know, making the glass for, for retrofitting homes cr creates emissions. Um, uh, you know, planting trees, restoring wetlands, um, performing agroforestry, uh, these actually reduce and absorb emissions. So nature-based solutions have this really special role um, in the fight against climate change and in, in an overall green response from COVID-19. So I think this shows um, really with some hard data that, that um, the recovery plans that, that have happened in Europe and around the world um, have a lot further to go when it comes to really getting a green recovery underway. Um, there are some lessons to learn from countries that have invested a lot of money, uh, but really a lot, a lot more work needs to be done to, to guarantee that we get the kind of green recovery we're all, we're all hoping for. I'll leave it there and thank you very much for your attention. 
look forward to questions thank as well. you <laughs> thank you jeffrey um i love this idea of nature-based solutions being sort of greater than the sum of their parts and having like this uh yeah more uh, extensive role to play in actually bringing emissions down and maybe if people are thinking of applying to this uh, story grant scheme then they can look at that current shortfall by from um nature versus climate measures there was a question i think we're going to have it at the end in a, yeah we're going to have some time for questions at the end but for now let's move on to um tian's presentation tian could you take it away yes Thank you, Laura, for the floor and the Earth Journalism Network and the um, organizers for inviting me to this panel. I will be sharing my screen here. Hopefully everyone can see it. So um, I'm very excited to be sharing the findings from the recent report of which I was a part of on promoting a green recovery in Southeast Asia. Before I get into today's topic, I would like to briefly share how I got into researching about the green recovery to hopefully motivate those that are new to the arena to cover this topical issue. So in October of last year, I was hired as a project specialist by the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada to examine the implications of COVID-19 on food and agriculture consumption, production and trade in the ASEAN region. The report led by my former colleagues and I was designed to improve ASEAN officials understanding of the impacts of the pandemic and aid their decision making on the um, post COVID-19 recovery plan for agriculture and food trade among ASEAN officials. So following this work, I was brought on by the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights to lead a policy assessment on whether COVID-19 measures in Southeast Asia were contributing to the Paris Agreement. And although I was comfortable with the research itself, as I was able to draw upon my technical skills and knowledge, I definitely experienced a learning curve in framing my arguments for parliamentarians who may have little knowledge about climate change. I mentioned this because in my perspective, many of you who are or aspiring to be journalists most likely already have the foundation to speak and write in layman's terms for policymakers in the public. Hopefully my presentation today, as well as Jeffrey's and Enrique's will help enhance that existing foundation. The recovery report, which was published by the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights provides a tool for members of parliaments in Southeast Asia to deepen their understanding of the type of measures needed to decarbonize the economy and inspire climate actions at the national level. The report identifies best practices that members of parliament can adopt in their respective countries, as well as obstacles that they need to overcome to promote a transition to a green economy. The assessment covered policies from February of last year and to April of this year, and it was conducted through desk-based research and virtual interviews with expert stakeholders. In addition my, to myself, the authors include Canal Gigante and Elise Tillier uh, Deguze. So what is a green recovery and why promote it? Green recovery is not a new term, but has gained significant traction over the past two years amid the pandemic and more frequent natural disasters as alluded by uh, Jeffrey and Laura. While green recovery is broad in its understanding, oops, <laughs> there are common themes in defining this term. Based on the interviews for the report, these themes include decarbonizing the economy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, renewable energy development, sustainable resource use, green growth uh, strategies, so job creation for sustainable sectors, diversification uh, of resources, as well as climate justice in indigenous and intergenerational rights. In acknowledging these differences and commonality, we define green recovery in the report as an umbrella term for regulatory and fiscal reforms that aim to accelerate economic recovery while cutting greenhouse gas emissions. For Southeast Asia, uh, for Southeast Asia and elsewhere, green recovery will help limit global warming and meet the objective of the Paris Agreements. In ASEAN, uh, climate actions can also avoid a 25% drop in GDP by the end of the century. Many countries in Southeast Asia are demonstrating unsustainable levels of debt. 
green recovery designed to mitigate the um, climate crisis can help reduce uh, risky lending strategies for fossil fuel and promote intergenerational equity and justice, especially as a younger generation will be servicing the current debt in the future. Additional reasons for promoting a green recovery include accelerating economic recovery through job creation and addressing the human rights ca uh, crisis caused by COVID-19 and climate change. The framework we use for our policy assessment was based on the work of Climate Policy Initiative in Vivid Economics, Oxford School of Enterprise and the Environment, and the feedback of our interview respondents. We group COVID-19 economic policies that directly affect the health of natural resources and greenhouse gas emissions into green policies and brown policies. Green policies refer to policies that help mitigate climate change and brown policies as those that contribute to heightened greenhouse gas emissions. In total, we examined 11 green policies and four brown policies for six countries in Southeast Asia. In this table here, as you can see, we found that most countries only adopted uh, measures under two or three uh, green policies with Singapore sending out by implementing uh, actions under 10 of these policies. Governments most frequently enacted subsidies or tax reductions for environmentally friendly products and investments in clean transport energy infrastructure in their recovery plans. No country, however, has taken any measures to promote uh, green conditional, to provide green conditional support, and um, no measures have been taken to retrain workers in green sectors or support the creation of green jobs during the pandemic. The few green recovery measures adopted were critically undermined by the fact that all six countries adopted negative brown policies that directly contribute to climate change. Most notably, all, country, all countries provided unconditional support for high greenhouse gas um, emitting industries, including aviation, oil and gas, and land development with no green strings attached. Most of the countries also granted subsidies for environmentally harmful industries or products during the pandemic. Before we get into the recommendations based on the findings, it is also important to understand the barriers to the green recovery. There are numerous challenges to, enable, to enabling a green recovery in Southeast Asia, which can be broadly captured in three areas. Firstly, countries in Southeast Asia lack strong institutional frameworks on climate change, making it difficult to advance structural reforms. In the Philippines, for example, the Climate Change Commission, which governs uh, national climate change actions and policies, has neither the carrots or sticks to encourage or reprimand actions among affected public agencies and private companies. This is a similar case in Malaysia where a clear mandate on climate change from the prime minister's office remains missing. Resource constraints amplified by natural disasters are also key limiting factors to a green recovery from COVID-19. Before, uh, between January of last year and May of this year, 92 natural disasters was recorded in Southeast Asia, which affected more than 17 million people and resulted in financial damages exceeding 2.85 billion uh, USD. And also recent disasters in the Philippines and Timor-Alas require the government to reallocate public uh, spending for the recovery to emergency re relief. However, the expediency with which member states manage a COVID-19 crisis indicates that mobilizing internal resources to address the climate crisis is possible. Lastly, a culture of information sharing within and between state agencies has yet to be widely fostered in Southeast Asia. The siloed approach of decision-making is pervasive as few countries have public budgets or incentives for cross-sectoral collaboration. And unsurprisingly, constituents which politicians represent are frequently left out in the shadows during critical policy decisions. Despite these challenges, we argue that members of parliament are well positioned to advance policies to reduce the adverse effects of climate change, raise awareness on the climate crisis, and scrutinize legislation that may be harmful to the well-being of the current and future generations. In the report, we present country-specific as well as regional inclusive recommendations. At the regional level, some of our recommendations for members of parliament are urging their government to submit more ambitious nationally determined targets to the Paris Agreement. 
prioritize budget allocations on renewable energy, public transport, transport, and other key areas supportive of low carbon economic transition, ensure social and environmental impact assessments are conducted for all recovery projects with public consultations, vocalize the environmental human rights concerns of coal development, and promote meaningful civic participation in environmental participatory rights. I want to conclude this presentation with a point that even if climate actions through policy reforms remain slow, it is critical to keep the conversation active through journalism and other forms of communication to raise public awareness on the green recovery. In a recent survey by the ICS Yusuf Isaac Institute, they found that most people in Southeast Asia view COVID-19 in the climate crisis as of equal priority for the government. So encouraging civic discourse on the daily effects of climate change while helping ensure the rights and aspirations of the most vulnerable groups are protected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tian, especially for yeah reminding us um, how important it is to be vigilant as journalists that these policies are reflecting um, yeah, the benefit of everybody. Um, and I can't recommend enough for people to read the report. It's really sobering, but it's also really clear and uh, yeah, approachable way to um, understand what's going on. Um, okay, next we have um, Enrique, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you very much, Laura, and thank you to, for the invitation. Very pleasure to be with you here today um, and really humble to be sharing with Jeffrey and Tian uh, with their presentations. So let me share with you uh, a few thoughts uh, around the green recovery situation in Latin America. Um, the, Latin America is a region that uh, has a lot of challenges and a, and a lot of diversity. There is something important to, to mention is that it's a really large region in the world and with more than 30 countries, including if we include the Caribbean, of course, and then the region has been always in the middle of the development. Uh, what do I mean with that? Latin America is a region uh, that where most of the countries there are actually middle income countries. Some of them low middle income countries, some of them high middle income countries. This means that Latin America is pretty much, I'd like to say the middle class of the world is basically that region that has a lot of potential, has a lot of uh, diversity, a lot of resources and at the same time is uh, a region that did not uh, achieve the development of other regions like Europe or developed countries. Uh, but at the same, so at the same time, it faces many challenges when it comes to development, climate impacts, biodiversity. There are a number of issues that make the region very diverse. Every country has their own diversity, even, and that reflects in their, in the societies and their um, and also the political systems, the political views, the ideologies. And this is something that is important to keep in mind every time we talk about Latin America. So when it comes to green recovery, um, Latin America has shown again a very wide diversity of reactions. You probably have seen in in uh, Jeffrey's uh, presentation that some Latin American countries were in those graphs and they were not performing well. Uh, some countries that might actually took steps forward were Colombia or Chile, Costa Rica, that kind of aligns a lot with some of the climate plans. Many countries, not only Latin America, but in the world, were updating their climate plans last year and this is something that in somehow helped it or contributed to some sort of alignment. But it's not actually something really um, notable. And it's not something that really addresses the problems. Most of the countries in Latin America were very much um, 
very much focus on the economics. Many of the countries lost up to 10% of their GDP last year due to the impacts of the pandemic into their economies. And this is something really challenging and something that at least in the minds of Latin American countries, uh, and I'm pretty sure it does actually apply to many others, that doesn't, uh, that overwrites every single rule. Like not, it doesn't matter what you do, you need to keep up or you need to sustain or you need to recover the economy. So the green part of the recovery was something that got very much um, delayed or it's something that it was not prominent in many of the countries. Let's say for example, my country, Argentina, Argentina, over the course of the year, was very much focused on doing social assistance and doing, uh, trying to perform a lot of support for the vulnerable population, and which is something necess necessary and was something that is important, but there was not any concrete plan in terms of uh, renewable energies, and it was no concrete plans on energy transition or uh, environmental protection. On the contrary, Argentina uh, last year, at the beginning of last year, passed a law about um, an exceptional wealth tax. So for the most rich in the country, there will be a tax that was aimed to um, fundraise a really large amount of money to help with the recovery of the, due to the pandemic. Unfortunately, 25% of that money went straight to the development of fracking in the country. So it went straight to the petrol companies to actually develop and continue with their business. 20% of that was actually for the Ministry of Health to deal with the to deal with the pandemic. And this is something, and this is how we see. It's clear that we see that it's really important the role of those companies in these countries. Latin America is a region with a lot of ex uh, history of extractive industries, a lot of damages to the, to the ecosystems and a lot of problems with, with the society, a lot of uh, threats to society. Latin America is one of the regions most dangerous for um, environmental defenders. And this is actually UN numbers. This is something to keep in mind when we talk about environment, green recovery, and when we talk about the future. That is something that is very important to see when we talk about Latin America and that we have seen very deep last year when with a lot of countries doing, dealing with that. Another issue there, speaking of economy, is that many of the countries in the region are actually under international debt pressure. And this is something that at least countries like Colombia and Argentina and very few others were actually very do, doing a lot of uh, uh, statements when it comes to the um, debt swaps. So um, climate action for debt swaps, for instance. This is something that has been presented at the G20. Is something that Argentina and Colombia together were publicly speaking, are the, the heads of states were actually talking about that a lot, where they actually are trying to trade the nature or, or climate action for debt uh, restructuring or debt uh, condonation. That is something that is really important to note because as you see, the, the green recovery or the, the economic development uh, plays a central role when it comes to the development of the countries and then environment or climate action, while in the papers looks quite okay in some cases, like Chile, Costa Rica, Colombia, Argentina, and others, it's not actually being reflected in the in the in the round. In fact, deforestation rates in Brazil and Argentina were actually not changing at all during 2020, while many other in uh, productivity in uh, productive sectors were actually suffering the impacts of the pandemic. Now, 
when when we we talk about that and we see like the the region is doing like uh, it's having a lot of challenges when it comes to the economy, and it's having a lot of uh, different change in priorities when it comes to where the money of the countries is going. Um, we also see that the climate action was actually something very important and prominent in the uh, in the plans for for 2020 and 2021. Uh, many countries were updating not only their national commitments on climate, but also their long-term strategies. And this is something that is actually pretty good. Now, I think the, the problem is that it's like we are seeing that being in silos. Like so the conversation on climate, the conversation, the, com the, um, the updates and the commitments under the Climate Change Convention are in one way and they sound very pretty, but when it comes to reality and what happens in the ground, it's a totally different story. And that applies to many of the, the countries in the region. So when we hear about the <clears throat> when we hear about the uh, sorry, when we hear about the different um, the different parts of the of the way it's communicated. Uh, there were many stories that I think that were very missing in the, in the stories that we saw in, in the news. All the stories were about health, all the stories were about the impact of the pandemic and the economical impacts. The one thing that is important to relate to the green recovery, and I think that is a very good story for Latin America and the Caribbean is the story about stranded assets. This is a complex issue that is really often not taken because it's really complex to explain it. When we talk about uh, stranded assets, it's about the investments we do today, expecting that they actually give a profit over the course of the time. But if the transition happens, those investments are not going to be given the, the profit we are expecting. To put it in concrete, if Argentina keeps exploding shale oil in Argentina, those are investments that should last 30 years. Any energy investment should last for 30 years. If the world is actually changing and transitioning to cleaner energies, the investment in Argentina is not going to be profitable maybe in 15, 20 years, not, and definitely not in 30. So it's actually a really big risk for investment in that country in an oil, gas, coal sector. That applies to most of the Latin American countries, Peru, Venezuela, Colombia, uh, <clears throat> all the countries of Mexico, all those countries are very rich in petrol reserves or gas and coal in, in Colombia. So if they keep investing there, it's, something, it's a very high risk for the future. And this green recovery opportunities that we have is, are the ones that need to address that because we want to avoid the stranded assets. So in terms of the, uh, the ways that those issues can bring solutions. Those issues need to have some light in it because people need to be, uh, we need to get reactions. There is a, a growing movement of kids around the world that is actually putting the pressure there. Now, they're asking for a future that they see already that is threatened by the people that is taking decisions today because we are now under the 30 years. And this is something that is really important for people to understand and to realize that we need to move ahead and start jeopardizing our future. And this is the type of story that needs to stop, needs to be more than general. It needs to go more, to go more concrete. It needs to go exactly with the key question of if we are going to produce oil, which cars are going to take that oil if all the in the uh, the automobile industry is shifting towards electric and other sources of fuel for the cars this is something those are the type of questions that need to be highlighted to question and to really put the pressure into that 
into the, the, the governments and into the decision makers in general and the population, of course. So I will leave it there. I think I have passed the time. So <clears throat> I hope that that is okay. I'm not sure, like, please, Laura, tell me if I'm okay with the time. Uh, that's perfect. If you want to stop there, thanks so much for uh, your presentation and yeah, making it clear that we're kind of working against the clock before or um, countries potentially get locked into what could be bad um, spending in the end. Um, we're going to go to some questions now. We've had a few come in. Uh, one, we're going to start with the one that was specifically to Tian. Um, let me just find it. Um, Tian, did any NGO um, in the ASEAN region go to court against the, the greenhouse gas emission raising policies in the COVID-19 recovery packages? Um, and if so, what happened? Thank you, Laura, for the question. I believe that was from Joy D. Um, so in terms of court action against COVID-19 recovery packages that weren't environmentally sustainable, I would say um, it, for national laws, the government has actually took upon itself to give itself more power. So civic discourse in this arena has actually been more restricted. And so there hasn't really been any court proceedings because there's no basis of laws that um, could really penalize the government to, um, in terms of not legislating more accountable environmentally friendly policies. What I can say is that in the Philippines, for example, they use human rights laws as a basis for court action. And so I think so in 20, December of 2019, um, the, I believe it was the um, uh, Human Rights Commission of the Philippines, they've actually made the findings or had the findings that fossil fuel companies and also large emitting industries could be held liable for human rights violation. And so this has to go through, of course, uh, legislation and court proceedings, but that would be an example of what some of the civil and non-state actors are doing to hold governments accountable. And this is important because there needs to be precedent set and there needs to be laws established so that civic government, uh, civic um, and non-state actors can push for reform. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of governments are, as I've mentioned, restricting uh, freedom to talk about COVID-19, even just the talking about um, system, sustainability of policies. And that's why in terms of our report, we, we actually um, made the respondent's name anonymous because some of our respondents were worried that they might be um, scrutinized by the government in some of the countries. So I would say that there are foundations to hold governments accountable, but at the COVID-19 um, current phase, there hasn't been any court proceedings led by NGOs, um, but there are actions being taken to hold certain departments such as energy accountable uh, to implement more renewable energy reforms. Thanks. Thanks, that was great. Um, we've had an, a, an anonymous question, which um, is an interesting one. Uh, there was a lot of disappointment at COP26 about the lack of commitment from wealthy countries to deliver funding for loss and damage. How does this affect green recovery? Are rich or, or Western countries more able to commit to a green recovery than poorer countries? Um, Enrique, Enrique, if you'd like to answer this, and also maybe Jeffrey, if you have some um, ideas afterwards, that would be great. Yeah, thanks, uh, Laura, and thanks for the question. I think it's a really good one because climate finance was definitely one of the uh, weaker outcomes of the COP. Uh, we were supposed to have clear signs of the 100 billion uh, commitment that is under the Paris Agreement and from way before as well, and also additional funding for adaptation and additional funding for loss and damage. So just, I think it's important to have that clarity that funding for loss and damage was actually separate from all the, was additional from within the, the whole finance package. Um, so I think that to answer that, which is not a really easy uh, answer, um, we need to see, we need to understand that 
all the funding that is channeled that is comp comprehended uh, in the under the UNFCCC, it is funding that needs to go for the development of the countries and, and the loss and damage funding is to attend critical situations and then the extreme weather impacts and all the you know, in adverse impacts of climate change. Now, if that actually relates to the green recovery in, in, in some developing countries, that is that will depend very much on the countries. I think that there are countries, and I will speak for Latin America, like I said, there are middle, middle income countries. It's not that they are conditioned strictly by the international funding. There are choices that developing countries could do and should do in order to move themselves towards a green recovery and to a clean uh, future. In that sense, um, it's balanced. Of course, if we had that money, if we had that funding coming, the transition would be a lot easier and a lot faster, especially in many countries that do not have their uh, their sources of fund, their own sources of funding. So I think it's important to have that clear and clearly. This is putting a delay in developing countries because they are counting with that. With the situation we have seen is that the the general conversation was about more ambition, more emissions reduction, but uh, developing countries can actually more, do more only if they got the, if they have that support. I think it's important that we have that in mind. Now, that being that said, that doesn't preclude developing countries to do actions on their own interests. Like I said, that relation to a stranded assets is the decisions that every country may, takes on their own. It's not that they can't uh, do anything unless there's money. So we need to find that balance and it needs to be appropriate for every development uh, within the developing world, because it is clear that a G20 economy like India, China, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, is not, the, is not at the same level as Bhutan, Bangladesh, or uh, Nicaragua. They have like different levels and they are all developing countries, but they still have uh, some differentiation amongst them. Just to jump in with one more interesting point, I think. Thanks, Enrique. But um, yeah, one more interesting point, especially dealing with the last part of that question, which was, you know, are richer countries more able to commit to a green recovery than poorer countries? Uh, when you look at the the volume of spending from from richer countries um, versus other countries, it's 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 incredibly different. So. Um, in the US and Germany, they committed something like 20% or 30% of GDP to stimulus measures. When, when you look at uh, a country like Nigeria or Burkina Faso, it was a, a tiny fraction of that. Um, and that tiny fraction in those, in those smaller, less developed countries was focused almost exclusively on a health response. So that wasn't really a green opportunity. Um, whereas in, in these richer countries, um, the 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 investment was enormous and and broad based. Uh, I think when you look at a per capita investment in some countries, you had you know three to five dollars per capita, twenty dollars per capita for for other countries. In um, in in the U.S. and Germany, you're looking at something closer to fifteen thousand dollars per person invested uh, from government spending. So there's a huge opportunity for that amount of money to be directed towards greener. Uh, investments that that aren't just exclusively dealing with the health response from COVID-19. Hi, Jeffrey, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if you can tell I'm having some Wi-Fi difficulties on my end, so I'm continuing on my phone. Um, we had a question about nature-based solutions um and more broadly about biodiversity i don't know if um jeffrey want to take that as well sure i'm just looking for that question nature in biodiversity is less of a priority than climate change but the two are more um but these two become more vulnerable because of climate change yes okay definitely how and what mechanism can we can we use to mainstream biodiversity and nature um, excellent, excellent question. In fact, I'm working on some, some work around this right now, looking at um, building off of the greenness of stimulus index and actually looking at mechanisms that, 
that assess uh, the impact of public finance on nature. So public finance uh, represents a huge amount of the global economy, um, like tens of trillions a year, uh, but there's really no assessment as to how that money is is impacting upon nature or upon um, biodiversity or, or, or the environment for that matter. So, so there's a real opportunity, I think, to screen budgets, to screen national budgets for their impact upon nature and, and climate, and to make sure that all public spending is nature positive and climate positive. Um, there's a lot of work being done um, through Finance for Biodiversity on the impact of development finance institutions on nature. They've done an assessment of all of the projects that uh, a handful of development fund um, DFIs, so development finance institutions like the World Bank or Asian Development Bank, um, for example, uh, fund. Um, again, this is public sector money going into um, projects that are meant to support development. Uh, so it's completely at odds that these projects should should undermine the natural capital upon which we all rely uh, or contribute to climate change, uh, which is a, a recognized and global threat and at odds with, with the investment priorities of these organizations. Um, so, so what to do about it is the question. I think one thing you can do is really develop, uh, it's, it's a bit of a technocratic response, but, but developing, <laughs> there's, a, there's a saying, you know, you can't measure or you can't manage what you don't measure. And I think you know, measuring things and understanding the impact of things is critical or else you won't, don't have any evidence base to, to rest your case. So I think measuring the impact of, of spending on nature and biodiversity is a critical first step. I think getting commitment um, for, for countries to not only measure but then improve their impact upon nature and biodiversity is critical. Um, and I think we need to really figure out um, how to how to integrate not only conservation, but also um, the kind of human nature interface, right? People rely on nature. Um, we are part of nature uh, and making sure that we can live in harmony with it is, is critical. And I think yeah, measurement is a good first step for that. It's really clear. Um, I think that's most of the questions we've got so far. So do submit some more if you have any. Um, I had a question just myself with Chan, who was, uh, when you were compiling that, um, the report, is it hard to find um, all of these, all of these policies? Are they, because yeah, often we find reporting on EU member states that not everybody submits on time or just there, there's a lack of data often. Um, is it, was it a challenge to actually compile um, this policy analysis that you did? Thanks, Laura. Um, yes, <laughs> so sh short answer, yes, definitely. Even the Vivid Economics report that Jeffrey has compiled, which was really good, it only focused on the G20 countries. And I, I believe it's like two countries within Southeast Asia. Um, so for myself, I heavily relied actually on news articles from journalists as well, um, in addition to technical policy reports that's, you know, constantly evolving. So I think that's where for this, I guess, webinar, journalism really comes in handy because they are on the grounds talking to members of parliament and also policymakers. And having those reports has been really beneficial for my um, the report that we've wrote, and also the uh, different databases. I think we've mentioned um, even the Asia Development Bank, they have COVID-19 database specifically for South, which is great. Um, of course, the problem is they look at all the measures, not really looking at sustainability aspects. There's also the um, global rep uh, recovery, I believe, uh, database that has been supported by um, the Oxford School. And so that has been really helpful as well, supported by United Nations. But in most cases, it's very, fairly much broad based. And that's why the in depth interviews with different stakeholders, such as parliamentarians, non civic, um, non uh, state actors, and academ uh, academics, has been really helpful because they are the ones who has these. Uh, various types of understanding of what a green recovery means. And it's also interesting, I think I've alluded to in my presentation, they each from their standing, they each have their own perspective of um, what green spending could uh, look like in the future. Some more focus on indigenous rights and intergenerational equity, looking at climate justice, others more focus on renewable energy developments. And so I think, um, 
for the future, hopefully this report as well as the others that Jeffrey and Enrique will be uh, developing will be serving as a source of resource for journalists who will also be contributing to this field. Thanks. That's great, thank you. Um, and just as a, we're, we're just about the end, as a closing question, um, could all three of you maybe just give, I know it's really hard, maybe just a brief uh, statement about what you would like to see as a, as a priority for, for green recovery. Um, ooh, how about we start with Enrique and then go to Jeffrey and then Tian, thank you. Oh, well, that's a really wide uh, <laughs> answer that I could give, but uh, I guess, um, when we look, I, I always like to, uh, when, when we talk about countries and the way that they can change things, uh, the, so those things that actually move the needle, I think I always like to go back to the greenhouse gas inventories. Like where is your sector that needs to be reduced the most? Like it's not the same for Brazil with a really large part of land use than it is for Germany with a really large, large part of energy. So for every country would be uh, very particular. And basically, if we talk about uh, mitigation and emissions reduction, I would look at those. I would look at the big uh, picture of the greenhouse gas inventories and that would actually tell you where you need to start. In the case of Argentina or in, in globally general, when you talk about developing countries, that would be the energy sector, including transport. But in all the countries, maybe it's nothing like that. And we need to put in there a lot of efforts on adaptation. And adaptation will actually have a lot of weight in many developing nations, and it will have a lot to do with health as well. So those are my broad general answers. Awesome, thank you. I know it's hard. <laughs> Can we go to Jeffrey maybe? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll stick partly with what I said about I think measuring the impact of spending is critically important. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you're looking for, for green recovery, I think it's it's important to recovery involves a lot of things, right? Recovery involves jobs and and stimulating an economy as well. So I think there's a real like, balance between between those those two, um, and it's challenging. I think sometimes to stimulate the economy without also stimulating more emissions and more consumption that that actually ends up harming harming you in the end. Um, so this is actually one of the reasons I found nature based solutions to be such a a winning um, uh, a winning opportunity. Um, you know, they outperform in terms of jobs, economic activity, and greenhouse gas reductions. They're really, they build resilience, they, they strengthen the um, ecological fabric upon which everything else is, is drawn from. So I, I, I you know, I, I used to be a real climate evangelist looking at um, renewable energy, energy efficiency, electric vehicles, all these technocentric solutions, and I'm increasingly recognizing the, the value and importance of nature-based solutions and and how those will kind of ultimately build resilience at a community level, as well as at, at a, a national economy level. Um, so I think that would be my my suggestion. Look look to nature as the next as the next big thing. Great, thanks so much. And yeah, a good uh, uh, journalist to be looking at covering that area where it's it's not being covered so much. Uh, Tian, same question. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. So I guess building upon Arike's and Jennifer's answers, I would say that for my ideal, I guess, um, future of green COVID-19 spending would be focusing more on the institutional aspects in addition to what they've mentioned in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and nature-based solutions. Um, in Southeast Asia as well, I'm sure in other places across the world, there's very much a still silo decision-making aspect. And so greenhouse gas emissions and nature-based solutions, they themselves are not sector-based. They require uh, collaboration between many different ministries. And that's why certain countries 
um, such as Singapore has done so well in terms of its green plan, but obviously not so well in terms of its investment in other areas. So having this type of dialogue and communication between ministries so that they're not fighting over limited resources is very important. Um, and also this will help map out priority areas. If one prime minister or one uh, parliamentarian have specific, um, I guess, um, specific investment ideas in one area and are not talking with another um, parliamentarian. That can create a lot of division and competition, which of course will not produce any positive impacts in the long term for the constituents, right? Um, so I think looking at the institutional framework is important and that requires investment because at the end of the day, when we're looking at policy reforms, they're not passed by any one person. It requires a whole group of people to pass legislation. And that's why par uh, the parliament and budgetary legislation and scrutiny is really important. Um, and that requires an overarching strong uh, framework for that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And again, uh, yeah, good ideas for what to focus on in terms of journalism and where there might be um, gaps. Um, I'd like to quickly remind everyone to check out the story grant scheme um, but otherwise just say thank you very much for joining us and um, thanks again to our experts that was really um, illuminating and um, yeah best of luck thank you <laughs> thank you very much thank you nice meeting you all thank you